I hear this man speak. He overflows with mission, wisdom, and a heartbeat that beats to the rhythm of urgency for people who still do not know the name of Jesus Christ. Clyde Metter is going to come and share with us. He has served with the IMB for 42 years. He and his wife, Elaine, were appointed. They were missionaries in Indonesia. He served as executive, vice pre- or executive advisor to the president. He retired, guys, and now God said, nope. And so now he's come back out of retirement, and he is stepping into the role to be our interim president. And so, Clyde, we look forward to hearing from Thank you. you. Thank you, Lord. Well, we've been here for about 48 hours. We, I trust, have been encouraged and we have been challenged. We have been reminded that we live in a lost world. We have been reminded that an amazing and frankly unforgivable percentage of the world's population has no access to the gospel. We have been reminded that most people in the world have never heard the gospel in a clear and meaningful way. But we've also been reminded that God gives us the privilege working together, partnering together to take his truth to the ends of the earth. We've been reminded, we've been encouraged, we've been challenged. So what next? I want to say to you, I've said this to missionaries around the world, but I want to say it again to them and to the rest of you in this room. IMB may be in a time of transition, and the president may be interim but there's nothing else interim about the IMB. No one has pushed the pause button on the IMB. We move forward at full speed. We move forward in the power of our Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, because we must not ever slow down with getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. Our mission, our mission has not changed and our mission shall not change. And a part of that mission is partnering together. To think about our next steps, I invite you to turn again to the Old Testament. It seems we're in the Old Testament these days. I invite you to turn to the book of Numbers, to the 32nd chapter. Numbers chapter 32. You will remember the background of this passage. It's about 40 years since the children of Israel had had their first opportunity to move into the promised land. And when the time had come, When the opportunity had come, they had chickened out. And because of that, they had spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. But then God gave them another opportunity. And there was a tremendous beginning to that opportunity. Before we come to this passage we're about to read, They were still on the east side of the Jordan, but they had defeated Sihon, they had defeated Og, they had defeated Midian, they had seen great victories under the power of the Lord. And now they are at the Jordan, ready to cross the Jordan. Numbers 32, the first verse. Now the people of Reuben and the people of Gad had a very great number of livestock. And they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place for livestock. 
So the people of Gad and the people of Reuben came and said to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the chiefs of the congregation, Adaroth, Debon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eliela, Sebum, Nebo, and beyond, the land that the Lord struck down before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. So these two tribes came to Moses, and they said, you know what? We have already conquered this great area, and this great area is just right for us. We raise cattle, and this is a great place for cattle. Leave us here and don't make us cross the Jordan. What they were saying is, we have found our comfort zone, that one term we often use. We have found our comfort zone. We have learned how to be comfortable here, and we are asking you to leave us here in our comfort zone. Now, a lot of times when we think about comfort zone, we we think about physical comfort. But that's not what we need to think about here this morning because I think most people in this room really are willing to forego physical comfort at any time to take the gospel to the places where it needs to go. Many of you in this room, not only missionaries, but many others, could tell many stories about the uncomfortable places physically where you have been. That's not our point this morning. But sometimes the comfort zone we get in is that we like to do the things we already do and the things we already understand. A couple of days ago, one of the pastors here was talking with me and said, You know, what the challenge is in our church is that we do what we do and we don't do what we don't do. And folks, most of us do what we do and we don't do what we don't do. But sometimes the opportunities in partnership, either direction, Both directions would require us to do some things we don't do, require us to be ready to take a new step that enters us into a different kind of ministry that our our church may not have been involved in before or the church may be coming to the field and there's an opportunity with the expertise that the church brings to move into new avenues of ministry, new avenues of introducing the gospel that we haven't used before And sometimes our response is, that's not what we do. But folks, we need to move beyond we do what we do because that's comfortable, because we know how to do it. We figured it out. God has blessed it. That's enough. That's good for us going forward. May we not say we raise cattle, so leave us here where it's a good place for cattle. But may we step forward. But that's not all that was said. Verse 6 says, as Moses first begins to respond to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, he says, shall your brothers go to the war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord your God has given them. Let others do it. Let somebody else do it. We've found our niche, and 
and you're asking us to do something that's bigger and takes more resources, let that big church with all those resources do that. Or we found our niche or our niches as a big church, and you're asking us to do something that would require a focus difficult for us, let that small church over there do that. Let the other guy do it. Or we as missionaries too often have said, you want me to spend part of my time partnering with that church and helping them get entered into the situation and become effective in the situation. I'm plenty busy. I've got plenty of things I'm doing. Let that guy over there do it. I'm sure he can take care of them. I'm sure he can create a great partnership with them. Have we said that? Let the other guy do it. Let somebody else do it. Now, those two things Moses responds to, the idea of staying in our comfort zone, continuing to do what's comfortable for us, the place where it's comfortable for us, and the sentiment of saying, let the other guy do it. Those two things bother Moses, but that's not what really bothers Moses here. Beginning in the eighth verse, we hear what he's really concerned about. Your fathers did this. When I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land, for when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel from going into the land that the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled on that day, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. None except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And then verse 14, and behold, you have risen in your father's place a brood of sinful men to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness and you will destroy all this people. Moses' greatest concern was that the sad history that had gone before would be repeated again. Folks, it's been almost 2,000 years since the Lord challenged us and those who have gone before us to take the gospel into every corner of the world. But instead, history has been repeated decade after decade, century after century, and the gospel has yet to go into the whole world. In 1823, a guy by the name of Stamford Raffles, if you've uh, been to Singapore much, you maybe visited the Raffles Hotel named after him. He was a British governor. And in 1823, at a, during a short time period when the British were in control of Indonesia, Stamford, who was an evangelical Christian, observed, instead of three missionaries in Sumatra today, there should be 300, and there should be 3,000 local evangelists working with them. 1823. We're just five years short of 200 years. I'm not sure that the aggregate number of evangelical missionaries who have served in Sumatra over this last 195 years would reach 300. And certainly there have not been 3,000 
Indonesian pastors on Sumatra, on that great island of maybe 60 million people today. Do you know when Sumatra began to be reached in a more effective way? We spent our first term in Sumatra and have always loved that great island. But do you know when new people groups began to be seriously reached in the last 20 or 25 years? It's when churches from the United States took on the task. And working alongside missionaries, or in many cases, just being blessed by missionaries as the churches themselves went, and began to go into people groups that had not been touched with the gospel. And there has been response. And all over Sumatra, there are places where this response is building. But that was 200 years ago. We are not there yet, after almost 2,000 years. So the question that comes to me, and the question that I lay before you, is will we repeat history? Or will we, in putting aside the comfort of what we're used to doing, how we're used to doing it, and where we're used to doing it, are we willing to put that aside? And are we willing to never say, let the other guy do it, but instead move forward, not repeating the history of letting the gospel stay isolated from so many people in the world. It's time to move forward after more than 200 years of modern missions. About 25 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, the Missouri Baptist Convention had a partnership with the country of Belarus. And there was a mobilization video related to that partnership, seeking to get churches and individuals involved in that partnership. And a statement in that video grabbed me when I saw it more than 20 years ago. It said, the place where we receive the gift of God is just beyond our borders. The place where we receive the gift of God is just beyond our borders. It's not talking about geographical borders. It's talking about the borders we put around who we are and what we do. It's talking about the borders that keep us in the place where we do what we're comfortable doing that keep us in the place working with the people with whom we're comfortable working. It's the borders that tell us what we are able, equipped to do without realizing that our God wants to equip us and makes a, make us able so much more than that if we are simply ready to step across the border and allow him to gift us through the power of his spirit to do things, new things, new places, new ways that we've not done before. This morning, the challenge to each of us is simply to think Reflecting on the last 48 hours, what is a next step God would have me take? What is a next step God would have my church take in partnership with somebody, some place, some people in the world? What is the next step God would have me as a missionary on the field somewhere in the world, take in partnership with others to see the gospel go more effectively, more completely, more rapidly 
to people who so desperately need to hear. How about us? Missionaries, pastors, other staff members, lay people. What is the border that encircles us? And are we willing, laying aside our comforts, laying aside the thought of somebody else will do it because they won't, and saying, I will not repeat history, but I will move forward in seeing the gospel taken to the end of the world. Lord, these folks came to the Jordan and they didn't want to cross it. We don't have a river before us, but we do have a Jordan. Each one of us has a different Jordan that you would call us to cross in the next step in the way you would use us. Father, do not let us come to the edge of our Jordan and turn around without getting our feet wet. Lord, do not let us seek to remain in a situation in actions that are simply comfortable. But Lord, draw us past our borders to be used by you in ways that we may never have imagined. Father, may you be glorified by the next step that you lead each of us to take. And it is in the amazing, merciful, gracious name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Clyde. Thank you.